Well, my next guest on the program now is Liberal MP Andrew Lamming, who joins us from our Sydney City studio. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, a lot of talk today about domestic violence policy. Everyone agrees we need to do something about this. What is a bit harder to get a grasp on is why, even though we're talking about it more, rates have been going up. Certainly, and in many of these issues, that's exactly the same narrative we faced 20 years ago with suicide, the same story. Uh, increasing challenges, complex society, social media, and the undercurrent of increasingly sophisticated drug networks. Let's not forget that behind a lot of DV is drug misuse. The Coalition Government has been really focused on elements like the healthy welfare card, uh, drug testing, potentially of welfare recipients who need to be ready for work, all of which have been obstructed and run interference by Labor. So a very, very important element of the DV conversation is illicit drugs that is sitting just under the surface. Is there a conversation as well about how well uh, criminalisation is working? Uh, do you mean criminalisation as in uh, of the drug culture or yeah. our acceptance of, of drug taking? I mean, we're seeing a debate about pill testing in music festivals, a fantastic mm. example of the, the battle between harm minimisation and supply reduction. But look, it's turning up everywhere. We saw the NRL this week with their decision to stand down from playing but not training. Uh, so even organisations are struggling with the reality of drug use and, and DV. But the NRL has this you know, slap on the wrist first warning for illicit drug use of a suspended fine. That's patently ridiculous and out of step with community standards as we realise the role that drugs play in a range of areas uh, that you don't always notice and DV is just one of them. On that point on the NRL then, I mean we're talking about someone using something not performance enhancing obviously and something that is in the rest of the population. What are you saying should happen to an NRL player in that situation? Uh, look, uh, fair question. And these um, highly paid uh, but very, very young athletes are held up and uh, viewed and admired by the rest of society. And the rule is just as you may want to be a truck driver, just as you may wish to be a young pilot, if you're a young rugby player, rugby union player or football player for that matter, or any sport, there can be no tolerance of recreational drugs. There's not an easy differentiation between social drug taking and addiction. These are slippery slopes. I'm not saying everyone is an addict. But we must be far tougher on uh, misuse of, of mm. drugs because of the impact it has, particularly on young people. And you can't go soft in an area where we're just tough on a tough, tough truck driver, tough on a pilot, but we have a slap on the wrist and a suspended fine for an athlete. And these are the individuals that are being followed by their thousands on Instagram. They need to be told, mm. if you're in this game, you're in it to set an example as well as play on the field. So, so what does that mean? Because you mentioned having zero tolerance, so one strike of drug use and they're out? And they're out your of the season league. is gone. The season is gone. The season uh, is you're gone. You're off contract. Right. The, cancel is can the contract is cancelled. And then, of course, you're back at the mercy of the governing body as to when you can return to the sport. But at the moment, it's uh, simply something that you keep doing until you get your first warning. And so, of course, this kind of behaviour becomes endemic. Then, of course, you have the other behavioural issues around you know, vi videos that everyone wishes wasn't online and, and then the subsequent release. This is all tied back, ultimately, to our general permissive attitude to illicit drugs and uh, then you're seeing the results that flow from it. We're going to be serious about stamping it out. We need leaders mm. uh, not coming up with, you can't play but you can train uh, these sort of bizarre policies. You've got to be super tough. Well, I mean, the policy at the moment on that one in particular uh, to do with serious offences, obviously, awaiting the charges to go through court, which everyone understands, but you want a, a zero tolerance there within the league, presumably beyond the NRL? Would it be anyone representing Australia in the Olympics, in Olympic teams, eligible for them? Well, wherever there's a governing body, they have to... Uh, the matter lies in their lap, obviously, but, but certainly mm. while there is a, a substantiated allegation and, and, and serious evidence that's going to be before the courts, you can't say it's... Uh, too much to play, but feel free to fraternise and train. It, it's either one or the other. Uh, the club either says we have significant concerns and we're standing the player down, or they don't. They stand behind the player, whether they're right or wrong. But I find the no playing but feel free to train policy, rub shoulders with the team and the club, but you can't run on the field. I don't think most Australians are going to accept that. You've got to be far stronger and say if there is a substantiated allegation, for goodness sake, the police are assessing the matter and there's a brief being prepared, that should be good enough to suspend their involvement in the sport until it's settled. Um, of course you can get uh, you know, malevolent and mischievous uh, accusations, but that's very, very different to a substantiated case that's 
uh, under police investigation, at that point you can't continue to reward potential perpetrators. You've just got to be frank about that. Well, there, that's, I guess, one example. What about if we take that out to politics? Should politicians be tested? A one-strike rule applied as well? Well, we've already introduced uh, testing. We've had a number of companies come down and offer testing, and obviously only those that uh, approached were tested. But I don't think anyone should have that's any That's a pretty easy testing, system, isn't it, Andrew? It I is. think if you don't want to get well, tested... Well, well, of course, we don't have a, a legislated system, but we brought the testing down mm. and tried to demystify it a little bit. But keep in mind also that the drug testers will tell you that while you can't make assumptions that in a workplace there will be a certain number of positives, it's a number between 5 and 10 per cent. An average mm. white-collar working population will potentially be positive for both you know, serious reasons and, and accidental reasons, but positives mm. are possible. And when you look at at, at age, you know, the, the, the odds of finding someone over 50 are going to be uh, far less likely than those under 50. So they'll be obviously stratifying their sample and identifying at-risk groups. Uh, one right. would argue that, that, that politicians over 50 are probably not going to be a key area of concern. Well, maybe not a key area of concern, but if you're talking about setting an example here, would you like to see your party say, we'll just show you that um, we are setting the example, we'll all be tested? Well, we've done the next best thing. We've We've brought the testing to Canberra and we've invited MPs to come up and do it, and a number of them have. But the next step uh, may well have to be at a local member level if you're prepared to have a significant proportion of your workforce losing their job on the spot with a positive test. Uh, why shouldn't a politician? And that's going to be an individual decision for a politician to make. I'm happy to sit the test any time, any place. All right, well, happy, yeah, so you'll go on the record and do it. But you get what I'm saying, right? You say we've got the next best thing. It's not really anything because if you think you might fall foul of the test, you won't do it. Exactly right. So the next step is obviously to mandate testing. And if should, we should think the Liberal that's Party an important do that? issue, uh, I think any, any individual politician can make that decision, but I don't think there's any yet substantiated case that we need to be checking for illicit drug use uh, in a population that's predominantly over 50. But if the evidence changes, I'd like to see it happen. In the meantime, I happily mm. donate my body to science and happy to be tested. All right, fair enough. I'm not... Uh, sure, exactly when they come down and visit and so on, but I take you at your word on that. Um, might just talk to you about where you've been today. You've been in another committee um, to do with teachers. It's an inquiry into teachers. I know you've been in some hot water before, including saying or asking if teachers are back at work this week or are they less in planning from home? Let me know exactly. What are you hearing uh, in this inquiry? Have you upset anyone out there in the profession? Well, I do keep retweeting that to remind everyone that I said it. It's a very serious question. It's how much do we expect teachers to be doing at home, living that half-life where they're taking unpaid work home in a way that very few other professions do. I mean, plenty of us out of passion enjoy a bit of work at home, but it's not necessarily an indispensable part of the career. In teaching, it's become a culture where the work simply can't be done because of the burden in class time. And that's actually hurting the uh, teacher uh, student time. It's meaning that mm. there's increasing legal requirements. Uh, this is complicating teaching. It's frustrating those that went into it for the love of it. And it opens up this new debate about if this is a, is a, uh, is it a unionised trade, is it a profession, and what are we doing to use potentially technology or a better understanding where teaching's heading to free teachers up to do what they're trained to do. I know one point of this is trying to increase the attractiveness of teaching. Is one element of that right now going to have to be better pay? We're hearing that it's not necessarily better pay. We know that if you move between sectors, uh, teachers in different sectors getting about the same pay have very different view of the world and their enjoyment of the profession. Um, I can't reflect on the deliberations of the committee, but simply mm. outside of that, we would all like to see all frontline uh, staff being paid more. Australians are very, very sympathetic and supportive of all of those professionals that work in these areas, and everyone knows that often a public sector salary isn't as high as possibly one in the private sector. We're delving into that a little bit more, but let's be realistic. We know there's not huge amounts of resources available to change teacher pay, so there may well have to be internal uh, changes within the very significant education budget to find a way to accommodate uh, teachers that are um, going through a career structure to have more attraction to staying longer so that they can see over the horizon that's worth staying in the profession long term. They're the issues where we're exploring. I, I know through your various tweets um, people have been having a crack back at you. Have any of your old teachers said, Andrew, didn't I do a good job? 
Uh, I'd reckon most of them would doubt if they did a good job when they spoke to me. But uh, you'd be pleased to know that I tweet into Twitter, but I never read the responses. Very good. All right, Andrew Lamming, Liberal MP. Thanks for joining us today. Anytime. Well, Australia is experiencing one of its weakest housing markets.